You know, sometimes I think we ought to just let her play the whole hour. You know, that'd be all right with me. I just, nice, nice mood music to sit and reflect with. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, got a few odds and ends to share with you. Um, and I think a lot of you know, uh, maybe not everybody, but this is the first week we've started again at 930. And then we also are having our 11 o'clock over there. That was kind of something by request. We'll see how things go. And we, uh, as always, we're monitoring things because everything can change, as you know. I mean, California, Texas, Florida are all finding that out. Um, but I do want to share with you, I, I feel like it's kind of encouraging. Uh, you know, each week we kind of look to see what's going on in our area and whether or not we need to do things differently. And this week, let's see, they posted it on the 22nd. Uh, Three Rivers listed, uh, they have, a, they have, one of the charts they show is the, uh, the risk, you know, the level of risk in the various areas. Well, so all three, Dodge, Washington, and Saunders County, have all gone down in terms of risk in the last, I think it's the last week, because I, I think it was the week before they measure it. But um, yeah, the previous week, gone down significantly. Um, and, um, and among those, 
Uh, Saunders, of course, is the lowest, and then and then us, and then Washington. But um, but all of us are in the lower part of moderate risk, which is, well, Washington's kind of maybe just over the line a little bit. But that's good because the week before we were kind of right on, uh, at least Dodge and Washington were right on the border between moderate and high. So um, I, maybe some prayers are being answered. You know, um, we don't have everything solved and. I feel like we're on a pretty good track as a church trying to be careful. Uh, we need to obviously be praying for the schools. I don't know how many conversations I've had about the school districts as they're trying to figure out what to do and how to do. And, and uh, several of you have asked about our involvement with the schools. And my answer to that is, I don't know. Um, I've had some conversations or tried to. Uh, I'm expecting to get a call again this week. One of the people I needed to talk to was away on vacation. Um, so we'll see what we find out. I mean, at this point, we don't know. Um, I do want to mention, because I'll forget if I don't, um, Esther and Red are supposed to come home from Legacy on uh, Friday of this week. And, but, but Esther's still going to be in a sling for a number of weeks yet. And so uh, there was a uh, the question rose whether or not we could help them out a little bit with meals for a while. Um, and, and the idea was if, if maybe we could provide a meal several times a week, you know, that would last a couple days for them. And I don't know what else they're getting going. And Mike and I talked a little bit. He was just beginning to figure some of those things out. Well, we, we have kind of started a sign-up sheet. And if you'd like to, be, if you'd be willing to help provide a meal or two uh, sometime between now and probably the end of August or so, uh, Mary has the list and, and contact Mary. And, uh, and we'll get something organized. I don't think, you know, there's no guidelines to it. I asked if there were diet restrictions and, and uh, Mike didn't think so. So I think we're fairly flexible with that. But uh, it, it could be a neat ministry I encourage you to consider. Uh, if you're not able to do that, that's okay. Okay, but those of you that can and would like to, it would be appreciated. Milton uh, Pokup, as you may know, passed away this week, these flowers. Uh, Jill sent in memory of Milt today, and Jill's out of town today, so if you want to try to catch up with her, don't do it today. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, he passed away on, on Tuesday, and uh, is that right? Tuesday, Wednesday? Uh, my poor brain. Anyway, uh, passed away Wednesday, yeah. It was Tuesday I was at the house. Wednesday morning he passed away. Um, and uh, the service is uh, this, this Wednesday here at the church. It's at 1030. Uh, if you want to do visitation, that is out at Mosier's, and that's from 4 to 8 on Tuesday. So just letting you know that as well. I have a, uh, a note I want to share with you that came from, the, um, um, from our missionaries, the Stantons. I know you, we, we've talked a couple times about that they were back, what, in Illinois or Indiana or somewhere and trying to get back to... Uh, overseas back to Hungary, and we're not sure how things were going to go. Well, she sent an email yesterday, and here's what it said. We'd like to thank everyone for their prayers. Shortly after our last newsletter, we received the girls' passports. We began taking steps to start our move back to Hungary. We applied with the Hungarian government, and in the same day, they granted our entrance. We will fly Sunday, August 23rd, from St. Louis, connecting through Chicago, Istanbul, and then into Budapest Monday night. I can't tell you how happy we are to get to return to our place of service. School starts for Rebecca and the girls September 1st. We don't know if it will be in the classroom or online or possibly a combination. Serbia is a mess, with the government lying to people about the, their coronavirus numbers right before an election, and now they've been put back in lockdown. The border is open, but for now it's not advisable that I go. But conditions are always changing. If we are in Hungary, I'm that much closer to serving the people in need. Please pray for us, for safe travel, for our witness, and for the people we serve. We're about to do something that not a lot of people have done, international travel in a pandemic. But by God's grace, we're ready. Thanks again for your prayers, continued financial support. And Larry's the one that actually wrote that. Um, I, reading between the lines, it almost sounds like they may go in stages if, if he doesn't, if he's not safe to go, that she may go ahead and take the girls and go and then him come after, but I don't know that. Oh, from, from Hungary? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so she, she, she said that, he, he, that a lot of what he did when he was in Hungary was cross the border over into Serbia as well. 
and that that's what he may not be able to do. Okay, good. Anyway, but that's a real answer to prayer, and I was thrilled when they shared that with us so we know. I also want to mention a couple other things. Gosh, I'm talking a lot beforehand today. Um, in terms of giving, um, people in, in the box is back there, and I know people have been donating, but I just want to let you know of two things. One is they're still working on getting the bus and been looking at some options and things, and so you can still donate to that. You just need to mark it that way. Uh, we're trading off the short bus that we had trouble with last year and, and replacing it and getting something, uh, something more up to date. Um, but the other thing is be thinking or kind of praying. You know, I know Moses Merrill's, you know, they haven't been able to have camp. They're doing some by Zoom. They offer cabins if you want a weekend away uh, as a family. But, uh, you know, their budget's going to be really hard, hit hard this year, and, and they've talked to churches, and the vision team's been talking about it, but we haven't, I mean, nothing's been set yet. But I just want to give you a heads up. There's a, there's a good chance we're going to have a Sunday sometime before two off long that we call a Moses Merrill Sunday, and maybe have Bev or somebody come over and talk about what they've been doing. And at that time, we're going to invite you to make a donation to Moses Merrill to kind of help. So just kind of a heads up, give you a little time to be aware and think about it. And, and uh, you know, this is just a strange time for our country, isn't it? And for our churches. I saw, I've seen several headlines about churches trying to figure out how to respond to the guidelines that are given and struggling with some of the instructions they've been given. And it's, it's a hard time. I'm thankful that we've been able to do what we have. And I'm, I'm thankful for so many of you who've, who have been faithful in coming and serving and giving and those who've gone out and done things to touch people's lives in the midst of this, but the work's not done, right? I mean, it's, it's not over yet. So with all of that, let's open and turn our thoughts to God as we begin with a, a beautiful little psalm, More Precious Than Silver.
Shall we pray? Almighty God, we come before you, and we pray that today we will have an experience where we see your beauty in a fresh way, where we are reminded of how precious it is that we know you, how wonderful a thing it is that you reveal your love to us. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, give us fresh glimpses of your glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue with a couple more songs, shall we?
God, in the quietness of these moments, may we sense your spirit. Lord, it's sweet to be in your presence. It's sweet to be with brothers and sisters who love you as well. Lord, in a world full of noisy clutter and things demanding attention and loud signs and warnings and fears and dangers and turmoil, we come here as a refuge, a haven of peace before you. Lord, be near to each of us in such a way that we can hear your voice. Speak to our hearts. Give us today those things that we need to serve you better, to love you more, to face tomorrow when tomorrow looks hard, to take on the challenges that you bring into our lives, to trust you when we cannot see our way. But in all those times when we stop and in the stillness, listen. May we hear your voice. As we gather today for worship, we would hold up some that we love who today may be struggling. We pray for the Mackenzies still in their loss of Ron. Give them the encouragement and strength that they need in a time of sorrow. And ask your blessing, especially on Charlotte. We pray for the Pocups as they look to a service coming up now that they've lost milk. Again, we pray your grace and strength and peace for Jill. Lord, we would hold up Paul Cash, the health things that he's been facing and struggling with. And, and in this week, Lord, things that he had he was trying that didn't all go exactly how they hoped and yet they continue forward we pray god that you step in and do the things that no one else can to keep him strong and keep his body responding and his love for you growing we pray for esther and red as they prepare to come home and the boys as they look out for them lord we pray that that recuperation and that that shift will work well I know that they long to be back in their home. God, make that transition smooth. Help us as we seek to undermine and, and under, undergird and encourage their lives in this time. Lord, we would pray for the Stantons as they prepare to go back to the mission field. In so many ways, you've already done some marvelous things by clearing the way. Continue to do that. Bless them as they go. Bless the ministries that they have. And may they be such a powerful blessing to the people that they meet overseas there in Hungary and maybe in Serbia, that you will literally change that environment because of their testimony. Lord, we would pray for the children of our church's kids club ministry and of our church. I had conversations with some parents who shared how hard this summer has been for their children, not being able to be with their friends, not being able to go places or do things, and, and uh, the gap that they've experienced. Lord, we pray that you use this time in the lives of those children as well, and help us as we seek to minister, and, and as we, that we try to figure out what can happen this fall as we try to move to where we can minister once again to the children. Lord, just guide us, give us wisdom. Lord, we would uphold today all those who are at home because it's not safe for them to leave. And some of them have been behind closed doors for a very long time and are struggling with that whole sense of, of loneliness and cabin fever and just wanting to see a blue sky or to feel the sun on their faces. Lord, minister to those folks. Help them to know that they're not forgotten by you. They're not forgotten by us. 
Lord, as we have reached out in a number of different ways, I thank you so much for the vision team leaders who have taken on the task of calling people in our church to keep in touch, to help people know they're not forgotten, they're not alone. And I, I pray that you bless each of those calls. May they be used of you in ways that we can't even imagine. God, as we turn together to look into your scripture, we pray that you would teach us, show us those things which would be needful for our lives and the things that would bless you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, uh, the topic was called, What's the Plan? And if you were here, you heard it. If you weren't, that's okay. Um, but, the, but we talked about how God's plan and how he works in his church is that people first turn to him in prayer and, and look to him for the answers. And then the second one is that, they, that, that we be out as witnesses sharing the story of our faith. And that was what he used in the early church. That's what he's used throughout church history. But this week the title is what's the passion? There's actually three little sermons, kind of a little set that goes with this. And I want to ask you a question. Do you remember the story of the time Jesus, you know, was chasing the money changers out of the temple, right? And, and there's a scripture quoted right there where it says, you know, uh, Jesus quoted and said, you know, my house shall be called a house of prayer, right? Well, you remember the other, other um, scripture that was quoted in the gospels at that time? in relation to that. Jesus also, or John quotes where it says, zeal for thy house has consumed me, from Psalm 69, as describing what Jesus was doing at that moment. Zeal for thy house has consumed me. What consumes you today? What consumes you? I know there are some today who really do have a zeal for the house of the Lord and they're struggling because their health or their doctor or whatever, they, they just don't feel like they can take the risk and come and they go, oh, I wish I could be there. I've heard people say that, but they feel like they can't. And so some of those folks are missing the Sunday morning worship. And I also know that there was a zeal because when, when, when we first got to open up again, some of the people said, oh, I've waited for this for so long. I, I'm so glad we get to come back together. So, I mean, that we've got some of that. But, but what is the zeal that consumes you today? Or, or maybe the more current term would be, what is the passion of your life? Or maybe I should fine-tune that question to, what has happened to our passion as people of God in churches across America today. What's happened to our passion? You know, a few years ago, there was a movement among young people, and, and they were called Passion, and I don't know that much about it. I, that's where I first met, uh, heard of Chris Tomlin and Lou Giglio and some of these folks. But, um, but there'd be thousands of young people gather and worship and praise and learning the scripture at these different places and, and had some quality things happen, but they named it Passion. And you can still listen to music, that, and it's identified as from passion. You know, that's, that's what it's called. You know, there are many people who are passionate in our world today. Some people are passionate about a cause, and they take to the streets and protest. Other people are passionate about their sports team, and they dress up, and they attend almost every game, you know. Other people are passionate about yards, keeping the grass and the bushes perfectly trimmed and look wonderful through their ongoing efforts. Many people are passionate about their physical health, you know, watching their diet, eating certain things, and making sure they have time to go to the gym and work out regularly. Some people have a passion and are consumed with good times, fun activities, others with financial gain, some with keeping up on the latest news. Others are consumed by obsessing on what's happening in the COVID virus world. People are passionate about so many things, about their social clubs, about their, about their cars or their politics or their business or their hobbies. And I would argue that everybody is passionate about something. And of course, we also think about romance as our passion, right? You have those passionate moments of love. And yet many people, the same people that have so much passion in these other areas, are very lackadaisical 
or indifferent when it comes to their spiritual well-being. And sadly, for many Christians, faith is not a passion. It's a diversion. It's something on the side when perhaps it should be our passion. And I think it should be our passion in specific ways, not just a random statement. I want to look at a couple of our passages for today from Paul, because Paul describes his passion in these passages. First out of Romans chapter 9, first five verses. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is of Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Does that sound like passion to you? Unceasing anguish in my heart for these people of my own nation, the people that receive the commandments who don't believe. Or in 1 Corinthians 9, he says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To, to those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul's passion was to do everything he could with his life to give people an opportunity to know Christ and to experience salvation because of the message Paul took. To share what he had experienced. To not just have it for himself, but for others. It's what he gave his life for. I believe that biblically, as followers of Christ, that needs to be our passion too. As we said last week, that's the plan that God has in his method of how he builds a church. How he reaches unbelievers. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my, wit be my witnesses in all Jew in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But I can't imagine that at least some of you today wouldn't say, but I'm uncomfortable trying to share my faith with others. It's hard for me. I wouldn't know what to say. I think a lot of Christians feel that way. And next week we'll talk a little bit about that maybe in a different sort of way to kind of help free you from some of those kinds of things. But I want to remind you of a couple of devotionals that at least some of you have read this week, if you've used the devotionals we provide here at church. In Secret Place on Friday, it said this. It was just a mumbling of regular barbershop talk until the barber stepped out from behind his chair and looked me straight in the eye and asked, how is your walk with God going? It was personal, riveting. It demanded an answer. What is this all about, I wondered. I was about to reply when a few more guys wandered in and the conversation took a different turn. But the question, how is your walk with God, stayed with me the rest of the day. What a glorious thing it is to sit in a barber shop of all places and have a conversation about God. Barbershop language is not conducted on the highest level, but this one was elevated for just a moment. When was the last time you asked someone how their walk with God was going? Talk about a conversation starter or stopper. I challenge you to ask the question of someone today. Well, that was the offer that was there for us on Friday through Secret Place. Then Daily Bread yesterday said this. God loves to use the people, or use people the world might overlook. William Carey was raised in a tiny village in the 1700s and had little formal education. He had limited succession in his chosen trade and lived in poverty, limited success in his chosen trade and lived in poverty. But God gave him a passion. Ah, uh, there's that word again. But God gave him a passion for sharing the good news and called him to be a missionary. 
Kerry learned Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, and eventually translated the first New Testament into the Bengali language. Today, he is regarded as, as and Daily Bread says, as a father of modern missions. Actually, I've heard more he is the father of modern missions. But in a letter to his nephew, he offered this humble assessment of his abilities. I can plod. I can persevere. Now, a little bit more on Kerry was that he was a cobbler. And uh, his call to missions came because he had a globe or map of the world that, in front of him that he prayed for. And that's what led him to head to India when he did. You see, passionate people will find a way. And they don't give up. A passionate Huskers fan. We're in Nebraska, right? So let's use that. A passionate Huskers fan might try to secure season tickets for the game. But if they're not able to do that, maybe get tickets at least to some game, right? And if they can't, can't even get to the game, they'll make sure they get to watch it on television. And if the television breaks down, then they'll go to the house of a friend. Or if the network has difficulties and they can't watch it on television, they turn on the radio. Or at least call uh, a friend who's at the game or been at the game to hear about it or read the papers to get the whole story of what happened. They're passionate about their team. And some of you are that way. We, you, know, you love to watch the game. It's, it's part of being a fan. And their checking accounts would reveal that that that's their passion because they purchase tickets to the game and there'd be receipts on the team apparel that they have purchased to wear and, or the television subscription that they've, that they've bought to make sure they can watch the games. And their calendars will show X's on Saturdays at the different times to make sure that that's when the game is so I can see it and I won't, I won't get tied up with something else. And their deeds will reveal their attendance at games, the putting on of colorful team makeup maybe or clothing and and their words will speak in praise of the great plays in the game, the things that their uh, team, favorite team players accomplished that day, their admiration of the skill demonstrated on the f field. Well, the same notion is true for Christians who have the passion that Jesus had. You could take all those categories and shift them over and apply them to those who are passionate about Christ. Are you passionate about your Savior? Are you passionate about what he is passionate about? You know, there's a recent song that's out, and I, I didn't bother to look it up. I, I, I could sing it for you, but I'd rather you stay here. But it's a song, and in the middle of it, there's like a little prayer where this guy says, Lord, Break our hearts with what breaks yours. Give us your passion. Well, what was Jesus' passion? Well, let me remind you of a couple of the passionate scriptures about Jesus. In Luke 13, 34, 35, as he came across the hill there during Holy Week, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you are not willing? How often he longed to bring them, to pull them in. As a matter of fact, in Luke 19, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. That was his passion. My passion is to come and find the people that need to know salvation and to save them. Like you and like me. And like the people that aren't here today and have never been here or at any other church. How he longed while he was on earth and longs even now to draw each of us into a close personal encounter and, and, and to reach out to seek and to save those lost. Even the people like those in Jerusalem who weren't interested in hearing it. That's still his passion. It's also been the passion of leaders in the church, generation after generation after generation. I want to read you just a few quotes. I was wandering around on the internet, which I don't do that often, but wandering around. I go, usually go to specific places. But I was looking for something this day, and I ran across a website um, by a group called, Bibli or I guess the website's called Biblical Missiology. 
uh, biblical study of missions is what that means. Um, and I don't know much about the group, but I like the collection they had on this page. And, and here's what it says. In his 1859 book, The Soul Winner, Charles Spurgeon said this, as Rachel cried, give me children or I die in Genesis chapter 30, so may none of you be content to be barren in the household of God. Cry and sigh until you have snatched some brand from the burning and have brought at least one sinner to Jesus Christ. The reference to the brand being snatched from the fire, that's a scriptural reference, but it's also the phrase John Wesley used of his own salvation, by the way. And then Spurgeon also said, he, this quote says, I long to hear my brethren and sisters universally saying, we are full of anguish. We are in agony till souls be saved. John Knox, the founder of the Presbyterian Church, said this, and this is a kind of the quote out of the website. Most of this is quote out of the website. I'll try to make sure you know. Dark days surrounded the fledgling Protestant church in Scotland as evangelicals were routinely burned at the stake for their faith while their Bibles were incinerated. The mid-1500s did not provide much hope, humanly speaking, for the change in this, for this minority. Yet there was a man whose prayer life was known widely and whose prayers were feared more than by Mary, Queen of Scotland, than an army of 40,000 men. On his lips was heard the agonized prayer, give me Scotland or I die. God responded in grace and a widespread awakening came to Scotland. Or George Whitfield, a Puritan preacher, banned from preaching in the early 1700s in the Church of England for his, England for his preaching an undiluted gospel, Whitefield was, or Whitfield, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong, Whitfield was an eminently useful tool in God's hands. He was said to have preached to the majority of the people in the 13 colonies in the U.S., as well as to the coal miners in England whose degraded lives prior to the gospel were notorious for their debauchery. Whitfield had a constant prayer on his lips, give me souls or I die. Whitfield coupled his prayer with no less than 30 transatlantic voyages, often preached twice a day, all week long, travel on horseback regardless of weather conditions, and receive rotten eggs and manure as gifts thrown to him by detractors. A man named John Hyde who was a missionary, was an American missionary to India, despite desperate to change the face of the country where he served, along with the state of fruitlessness in his ministry. His biographers tell of his callous knees, nights in prayer, and they dubbed him Praying Hyde. The prayer on his lips was, give me souls. First one a day, then two, then four, or I die. Charles Kalman, who is the founder of a group known as the OMS International, said that, quote, the winning of a soul was to him what the winning of a battle is to a soldier, a race to an athlete. He was said to live just for one thing, to win souls for Christ, and his burden for Japan caused him to say, by the help of God they shall hear, if it costs every drop of my life's blood, here I am, Lord, send me, send me. And of course, in this congregation, we have heard, I hope you remember, uh, Marian Anderson talk about her uh, grandfather-in-law, you know, who gave his life preaching around the globe. And then the, the, the website goes on to say this. Missions in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, which that's our time, right, appears to have a strong bent towards getting certain methodologies just right. Methods, not the undiluted message rules. This short piece proposes a different strategy. It's derived from the thinking of Charles Spurgeon and a few others who were eminently fruitful in winning souls for the Lord. Each had a holy desperation to see souls won for Christ. What's happened to the passion of God's people? Where are the Pauls in our church, in the churches in America, who, whose greatest desire is not merely for their own spiritual well-being, but an insatiable desire to reach others for Jesus? And their souls are in anguish 
knowing that people around don't know him. How have so many of us allowed ourselves to become so lukewarm, so uncaring, so timid, so indifferent, so unchrist-like? When the greatest desires in our lives is that we too desire to share the gospel story with people who haven't heard yet, to share how Christ has changed our lives, then we will see God's hand moving in mighty ways in our church, in our community, in our country, around our world. When our calendars and our daily schedules reflect even a tithe of, a time, of our time, a tenth of our time, dedicated in passionate service to Christ, we'll discover that God can use us at every turn. Like that cobbler named Carrie. When our checking account registers evidence of a priority of our investment in the work of his gospel, then we'll see our investment multiply in the kingdom, bringing person after person into the field, into the fold. When our actions are the deeds of Christ, the deeds that he would be doing, were he in our situation, probably like that barber we referred to earlier, and then our words reflect the character and love of Christ, then we'll become more like him, and people will be drawn to the sweet fragrance of Christ through us. Make your first prayer for God to restore the passion of your faith. If you don't, if you don't know what that was like, maybe it's been too long since you've had that passion, or you know, maybe you've never experienced a passion that you came to Christ, but, but, but you've never been consumed with a passion. Ask God to give you that. You don't know what you're missing. You know, people like being around people of passion. That's why going to ball games are so much fun. Because people are excited and enthusiastic and they want to be there. Sadly enough, that's often why they don't come to church. Because we aren't. They want something more. Today I want to ask you a question. I, I hope you take time, by the way, to look at the pondering questions about your passion and how it's reflected in your life. But I'd like to close with a simple question. What if God wants you to be the next William Carey, George Whitfield, or even the next barber that walks around the chair? And he, he wants, wants you to be the person whose passion is so contagious that it changes the spiritual temperature of our whole country. No matter what your age, I mean, Noah didn't think he could do anything. He's too old to build an ark, and he did anyway. And uh, Caleb believed he wasn't ever too old to slay the giants. What if you're the one that God wants to use your passion to change the temperature of our church, the temperature of our community, the temperature of our country? Would he find a willing servant when he looked at your heart or mine. Let's pray. God, make us a people of passion. Create within us a deep uneasiness that causes us to be just overwhelmed with our concern for the people who don't know you yet, who've not heard that they can be forgiven, that life can give them a second chance, that somebody loved them so much they died for them and wants to have them with them forever and eternity. Things that we as church people have heard so many times and know so well, and yet there are people who have not a clue. Lord, Lord, give us, fill us, set us ablaze with the passion of your spirit for those who are lost and for the opportunity to share the gospel with them. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the way things have been service-wise, we haven't really done invitations because it's such an awkward environment right now. But this next song is one I like, and it's one you know. 
I want to invite you to use this time in kind of a prayer as you listen to the song and you sing along with it quietly if you do under your mask. That's what I do. That's why I grab the mask each time. Make your prayer, God, fill me with passion for you. I encourage you to do that. If we were going to have a, an invitation hymn, I would invite you to come up here and, and pray that prayer with me. But today, where you're at, as the song plays, I invite you to consider making yourself available for God to use you to spark passion. God bless you. Have a good week. Again, I'll slip out this way and be glad to see you down by the door down there.